Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Vanda Vickers from the Global Risk Institute and delighted to welcome you to today's webinar on geopolitical risks, the Russian attack on Ukraine. Although this event is virtual and many of you are joining from across Canada and beyond, I'd like to acknowledge that the Global Risk Institute is headquartered in Toronto, which is situated on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. I acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Before we begin today's session, I'd like to review a few housekeeping details. Please note that uh, today's session will be recorded. Be uh, we'd also like to note that your microphones have been muted to avoid background noise, and we've allocated Apple time for questions which will take through the chat function, which is the little bubble at the bottom right hand side of your screen. Uh, we will address as many questions as we can during the Q&A portion of this event. Um, this, as I mentioned earlier, will be recorded and it will be uh, shared in a past events page on our website. And finally, when leaving the event today, a survey prompt will appear and your feedback is valuable to us. So please appreciate your considerations for future programming and giving us some feedback on the, today's event. Our moderator today is Mike Smarolia. Mike's an executive in residence at the Global Risk Institute, and we are honored to have Janice Stein as our guest speaker. As a Belzer Professor of Conflict Management in the Department of Political Science and the founding director of the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto, Janice is uniquely positioned to shed light on the recent crisis and the potential course of stakeholder actions and reactions to developments. And now over to both of you. For this fireside chat. Thank you, Vanda, and good morning, Janice, and everybody on the call. Just before we start, on behalf of Janice and all of us at GRI, we'd like to acknowledge the immense suffering that the brave people of Ukraine have been enduring over the last month. They're demonstrating extraordinary courage in the face of extreme hardship. I know all of us on this call are joined in the hope that this conflict can come to a peaceful end just as quickly as possible. Janice, not surprisingly, the first question I'd like to kick things off with has to do with risk management, which is very much at the heart of decision making in the geopolitical arena. And we know that effective risk management relies on good risk assessments. However, there seems to be a long and storied history of significantly flawed geopolitical risk assessments, and this conflict is certainly no exception. Russia seems to have underestimated the extraordinary resiliency of the Ukrainian leadership and the people. They've underestimated the West resolve to swiftly impose sweeping economic sanctions, and they appear to have overestimated the effectiveness of their military capability on the ground. For their part, NATO has clearly underestimated Russia's willingness to launch a full-scale invasion of Ukraine, despite when witnessing months of military buildup. So what is it about geopolitical risk that makes it so notoriously hard to accurately assess? Um, good morning, Mike, and that is a great question uh, because, as you say, good risk assessment is at the heart of every successful strategy. It doesn't matter uh, which domain you're working in. Let me just point to one very successful risk assessment in all of this, which is surprising uh, to many of us, given the track record, but U.S. intelligence got this almost 100% right, and shared that intelligence estimates with experts around the world before the war started. So there's a whole subsection of questions here about why experts discounted uh, these very explicit warnings that we were getting from US intelligence about what the Russian invasion would look like. They really, um, and it is worth pausing over for a minute, they got this almost letter perfect, frankly. What's the more generic problem uh, that you're putting on the table? And I know this is baked into the DNA of the Global Risk Institute, but to do good risk assessments, you need to know something about the underlying probabilities. So let's put a problem on the table right now for everybody on this call. Uh, NATO uh, in two days will begin an unprecedented discussion about how it will respond to the use 
of a the possible use, let me put it that way, possible use of a tactical nuclear weapon uh, by Russia in the, in, in the war. Well, we don't have any probability assessments. It's never been done before. So we are in the world, not even of Nassim Taleb's black swan, because for Nassim, those are events that occur, occur way out in the tails of the probability distribution, but we've still got some probabilities. We are in a very different world here, which is the world of uncertainty. Uh, now, um, there are parallels in, in economic policy and in business decisions where leaders find themselves in a world of uncertainty where there's just not enough uh, trials that proceed to construct any kind of even rough approximate probability distribution. So how do we handle this? Well, there is just a ton of work that tells us what we do. We fool ourselves. <laughs> we don't acknowledge we're in the world of uncertainty. And we start using words like, how likely is this to happen? And it is it requires a tremendous amount of self-discipline. I'm in a position a lot when uh, a policymaker will ask me, how likely is this to happen? And I give the career limiting answer. I don't know <laughs> what, what I really mean is. There's just no, we don't have any useful background data here that can enable us to improve um, our assessments. Um, one of the things we do do, and uh, we might, hopefully we might have a chance to talk about this a little later, is we build scenarios on what might happen. And it's really important to do that when you're in a world of uncertainty. You build scenarios, but um, we have to be very careful, especially when we give advice um, to our government. We don't know which scenario is more likely, which is so as possible. And, and NATO, to make this really concrete in Brussels on Thursday, is going to spend a fair amount of time discussing a scenario for which they have zero background probability distribution. I can't attach any meaningful likelihoods. Uh, well, given that that backdrop, that I, I want to make I want to make it worse for all the decision makers in the room. <laughs> you have okay. to make these kinds of strategic. Let me just make it worse. So when you're trying to think about whether this scenario might happen or not, we use logic, right? That's how we argue it out. But here's the challenge. The logic that NATO is going to use is different from the logic that Putin is going to use. So ultimately, the only, the best that we can do is try to get inside the thinking of the other decision maker on the other side. But that's that's an art rather than a science. Interesting. Well, given that backdrop, Janice, and that that poor track record, is there a next potential failed risk assessment that particularly concerns you on on you know from from any participant in this process? Yeah, I I, I think there is, and um, it's the one I just talked about. That, the the biggest challenge we face now we're probably going to come at this in several ways uh, during our conversation mike but the biggest challenge is thinking about how this conflict is likely to evolve with a particular focus how is it likely to escalate because what we're really seeing if i had to summarize these three weeks um Putin has made his objectives clear now, and events on the battlefield um, are not thus far uh, enabling him to, to achieve his larger strategic objectives. It has gone much more slowly. It is much more challenging, much more difficult. Uh, many more Russian military deaths than they anticipated. By the same token, President Biden, before this started, knowing it was coming because U.S. intelligence was so good, put a ceiling on what the United States would do and what NATO allies would do. And the goal here is avoid any escalation to a direct all-out conflict with Russia. That's the frame 
under which policy making um, has occurred. And that's why to the frustration of many in the Western world who are outraged, outraged by what they're seeing and beginning to put terrific pressure on our decision makers as a result, a no-fly zone was taken off the table because that risk assessment was, now look again, we're using the word risk. You know, we shouldn't because we're in a world of uncertainty. But the sense was, this is gonna, we could map out the scenarios here where in a no-fly zone, which involves, by the way, taking out anti-aircraft batteries on Russian territory. So you would have had to attack on Russian soil. And then if a Russian aircraft took off, you would have had to shoot it out of the sky. The argument was no, off the table because this takes us too close to an all-out war with Russia. And that is the defining objective of US and NATO strategy right now. Help Ukraine in any way possible, short of escalating to all-out war. Now, we design our strategy to do that, but here's, I think, the biggest challenge. What if President Putin escalates? Uh, and he could in many, many ways. When he, when his army did poorly on the ground, they moved to these massive um, artillery bombardments on cities, which we're seeing, which is frankly laying Ukrainian cities to waste. We, 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 they are reducing Ukrainian cities to rubble, something that we never imagined we would see in Europe again. Um, this is close to saturation bombing. That's what we're seeing. But he has other options, right? And one of two are the two uh, of the most worrying are these: uh, one that he uses any chemical or biological weapon um, in the theater of conflict. There is no precedent for what the NATO response to that would be. Here's why: it would be an escalation in Ukraine, but not against NATO members. No guidelines. Even worse. Uh, would be use of a tactical nuclear weapon in the battlefield. And U.S. intelligence has been warning about the possible use by Russia of unconventional weapons. Um, it would not meet the Article 5 requirement that a NATO member has been attacked. But if you look at the likely response from Western publics, one of the big challenges for every country in NATO and for our own as well is that the outrage that would fall from that kind of action would make it virtually impossible for our leaders um, to stand aside. So in that sense, this is a critical summit coming up in the next 48 hours. And they are in uncharted territory with very little other than what we talked about at the beginning, logic and the best available understanding they have of Putin, which is by definition limited since they have no access to him. Well, let's turn to sanctions then, Janice. Uh, we know this war is being fought on multiple battlefields. There's obviously the military operation on the ground and all the complexity around that that, that you just walked us through. But we also have the economic battlefront being waged with economic sanctions, trade restrictions, or what Putin has described as economic blitzkrieg. Can you help us understand the dynamic between these two battlefields? And in particular, if Russia does ultimately prevail militarily, how confident are we that economic sanctions can still lead to an acceptable diplomatic outcome? You know, I'm so glad you asked me about that, Mike, because the economic war is not getting the attention that the military war is. And yet it is, I think, so, so important that we understand it because in many ways it is equally unprecedented. We are breaking new ground here all the time. Uh, and let me say that when you do this in a crisis, um, Sometimes we don't pay enough attention to unintended consequences. So what is radically new about what we've done? And President Putin is not wrong. We have declared economic war against Russia. There are um, and sanctions have been used for a long time. And by the way, 
with dramatically increasing frequency over the last 20 years, which is a subject for a whole other discussion. Um, and the, the characteristic of sanctions is they can inflict really severe economic punishment, but they are slower to work. They take more time to work. So when you slap them on a country at the beginning of a hot war, the economic impact of sanction is going to lag what is going on in the battlefield. So it is not a fair expectation to say sanctions aren't working. They were never designed to work in real time. What they are designed to do is influence the calculation of the leader that is waging war. So we're asking President Putin, just let's all be clear of what we're asking. We're asking him to engage in forward economic forecasting to estimate the impact, the ruinous impact, frankly, that these sanctions will have on the Russian economy, and then to change his battlefield behavior um, as a result. Um, that's a tall order, um, frankly, so I'm not surprised. Let me talk about two ways in which the economic war is unprecedented with, and I, and I will just share concerns I have about consequences that could flow from this um, longer term. The first is we never before sanctioned a central bank of an economy the size of Russia. Uh, why were those sanctions imposed for a very good reason? They froze um, the assets that he, the euro assets and the dollar assets, the reserves that Putin had accumulated in order to insulate himself against the cost of trade sanctions, which is what he expected. He did not expect this. But as a hypothetical, you're the government of China with $3 trillion of reserves, largely denominated in euros and dollars, and you watch this happen, it's entirely conceivable that they will say, this is, this is an overly risky exposure. We, and I, I would be shocked if they don't do that. They've already done some of it, but it was at a slow pace. But this is such an escalation of economic warfare that not to move some of those reserves out of Euro denominated and dollar denominated um, currencies, it would be surprising, frankly, if that were not to happen. And as you know, China is a very significant holder of US dollar reserves. So that is something that I would put on your radar to do the risk assessment, um, because this is now, I think, entirely conceivable. The second, and there has been some discussion about this, but probably not enough in all honesty, is sanctioning, removing Russia from SWIFT, which as I think everybody on this call knows, the system of interbank messaging. That's really what it is. It's very sophisticated and elaborate messaging system, which clears 24 hours a day and is very efficient was used against Iran um, with, you know, and it was highly effective, but the Russian economy is an entirely different uh, player than the Iranian economy. Um, and here's the, here's the risk of downstream um, that I would be looking at. Uh, China already set up its own interbank messaging system in an effort to make itself less vulnerable. Um, to these kinds of sanctions against SWIFT. It's growing. It doesn't approach SWIFT, which is as Belgium based. Uh, and actually, the Chinese system uses SWIFT to clear currently, but it doesn't have to. It would not take much of a reset in order for it not to have to do so. Russia has set up its own system. It is conceivable. And again, ask me the likelihood. I'm going to give you my professional answer. I don't know. I don't have enough good data. This has not been tried, but it's entirely conceivable. They're looking at the ferocity of the economic war. Um, Russia and China collaborate to stand up a much more effective parallel system to SWIFT. And if we're looking at scenarios 
10 years from now, it's not hard to imagine two global systems, each operating in different parts of the world with all the transaction costs that that would apply. You know, in my world, we work on these kinds of problems. And what we've done here is weaponize um, the international financial payment system. We've turned it into a weapon, not for the first time, but never at that least level. And if you do that, there is an inevitable counter reaction to it as other countries recognize their vulnerabilities. I think a good lead in to the whole issue of, of global trade. Uh, and so we recognize that this crisis represents the third major blow to globalization in the recent years. The other two obviously being US China trade wars and COVID. Is the world then facing a fundamental revaluation of global trade and supply chains and and how will global trade you know be restructured if so? Um I've been arguing that we are um for several years now, even before this. And what do I look at, Mike, to come to that kind of judgment? Uh I really look at the consistent drop more or less and certainly lack of growth might be the better way to put it in global trade as an overall proportion of the global economy uh, with one big exception so the more accurate way of describing this is we've seen a downturn in growth of global trade in goods and services that actually starts with the global financial crisis which was the prior big shock um, in 2007, and it's a secular trend. You know, it stabilizes for a bit, but it's been going down. The big exception is this huge explosive growth in trade in digital products and services. So as the, as the real has dropped, the virtual has shot through the roof. Um, when you sanction trade the way we have, the dislocations in the global market and in global supply chains. Uh, let me talk about two, um, which I think many of you are aware of, but just to trace these two very quickly, wheat, right? Ukraine and Russia I think, supply about 40% of global wheat. They cannot now export it. Um, and people can't buy it without being subject to secondary tertiary and, and secondary sanctions. Um, uh, the consequences for the Middle East are, and Africa are just disastrous. And uh, so it's not only about the exports of Russia, it's about the dislocation that's gonna happen in other, part of the, in other parts of the world. Uh, we can trace a very strong relationship between increasing the price of wheat in the Middle East and street riots which lead to either in one or two cases, overthrow of the regime or really severe repression when this happens in dislocation. Um, that's a predictable, frankly. I, I, I mean, I, I'm so confident that that will happen. Um, is it an opportunity for Canada to export more wheat into the global market? In theory, yes. In practice, no, because right now our wheat supplies are tight. But all those supply chains that connected the Russian export of wheat through three continents are now blocked, frankly. Fertilizer, <laughs> something very real, very, very concrete. Russia is a very large exporter of fertilizer. So look at the layering on impact on food security and crop growth around the world. Um, that is gonna ripple through every supply chain that we know. And just to make life uh, even more challenging, we have, for the first time in China, a rapid spread of COVID, Omicron, which is shutting down major cities um, and blocking supply chains. So we are in a process, there's no question, of reconfiguring supply chains I would be astounded if our economic decision makers are not doing a hard look. <laughs> Where are we in these global supply chains? Are there workarounds for this? And when we put in place workarounds, 
we don't revert back as quickly. There is a lag effect always. I can't imagine, frankly, people going back um, to Russia having I mean, as a reliable um, supplier for a long time, given what's happened. I, I, I should just add, um, Mike, this has to be one of the Russia's decision, Putin's decision has to be one of the greatest strategic errors made by a leader of a developed economy. It is catastrophic for Russia. We talk as we should a great deal about Ukraine, but this is a catastrophic decision for Russia, which is gonna cripple its economy and drag this country back 20 or 30 years. You know, leadership matters, strategy matters, and decision-making matters. Well, just to, just to pick up on that theme then, because another set of stakeholders that, that we've seen kind of weighing in have been private corporations. And, and we've seen a massive wave of private corporations going beyond the legally required sanctions and suspending or even completely withdrawing their business uh, from the from the Russian market. Is this just kind of short-term reputation risk management or does it indeed reflect sort of a more fundamental you know, revaluation of commercial risk return trade-offs. You know, I think it's, um, I think it's more the latter than the former. Um, what speaks to the former issue of reputation management and risk management um, in the immediate sense uh, was, I think, um, the evaluation by many uh, public-facing companies who serve consumers that there was just huge reputational damage from continuing to be there. And so the Starbucks, the McDonald's that are largely public facing companies left um, at an astonishingly fast rate. Uh, but I think there is a longer term perspective underlying that because when you sanction trade and you sanction banks <laughs> and you sanction fundamentally currency exchange, the ruble is now a non-convertible currency as a result of this. And you have companies that are headquarters in Western Europe or the United States that are doing, that are transacting business in rubles. You can well understand why their CEOs would say um, the risk is not worth the return of the consumer market. I think uh, it's, a, again, it's a very interesting bellwether because I think what we all need to do is not look only at this event, but what are the unintended consequences down the road? Does this set the bar then, Mike, for every time there is a, a conflict that we think um, is unjustified, where there is an un, you know, unjustified attack against the civilian population? Is the expectation now? that banks, companies, consumer facing companies remove themselves and leave because the reputational damage is too high. So what's the bigger picture you and I are painting here? <laughs> Where here's the worst possible outcome of all of this, which was had been possible five years ago, but now I think is, is squarely on the radar screen. We are talking about and there's one, one exit from this, we'll come to that, I'm sure. But we're talking about a divided global economy, a divided global trading system, a divided global financial system, uh, where the costs of trade, it's not that it's impossible, but that the costs of trading across that divide just grow and have implications for what's efficient to do. I guess everyone pays the price when, when that happens. So there is certainly blowback and broader, broader collateral damage from from sanctions yeah. in terms of uh, how it yeah. impacts you know, all, all, the, all the economies. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, and you, you've referenced China a couple of times in, in your remarks, and, and you know we, we saw the you know no, no limits declaration in the leaks you know before the the Russian invasion. You know clearly the relationship between China and Russia is continuing to strengthen on, on many levels. Just how far is China prepared to go in its support for Russia? 
how might the West respond? You know, that is a really central question to what everybody is thinking about right now. And, I, and let's just stop for a minute and say, where are we in the world that the country that NATO is looking at and Moscow is looking at is China? Does that tell us something about the world we're moving into? How important China will be? in that world and frankly how important it is to keep lines open and connections going to a country that is so important um, there have been extensive conversations between the biden administration and the xi jinping administration on multiple levels not only the highly public telephone calls between the two presidents um, and Russia is, uh, China is a linchpin here. Uh, it is the largest buyer of Russian oil and gas, and it's contracted. Uh, it, they do business in renminbis, and uh, not in dollars. And that was very deliberate to insulate themselves from the kind of thing that we actually see happening now. Vladimir Putin is totally dependent on Xi Jinping for an economic rescue. Uh, that is his lifeline economically. There's no question about it. Uh, and regardless of the, you know, the, the, the discussions of long lasting friendship, there is, there is in China, a, and, and there's politics in China, let me add this. <laughs> There's politics, there's politics in any system. There's politics in China too. There is a division among the more Western oriented economic thinkers um, in the Chinese policy community and those that are uh, more anti-Western. Um, and those arguments are now being fought out in, in the press uh, and in, in specialized journals in China right, as we speak in which one group, the hardliners, say it's overwhelmingly in our interest to sit back. You know, the United States and NATO are being pulled back into the European theater. Defense spending is going to go up in NATO. That's all good news for China, because it's not going to be focused on the Pacific. That, you know, much talked about pivot to the Pacific is radically slowed down by this. We do nothing. Uh, we sit back and we reap the, the benefits of this. And that's one important school. The second is um, this, and it's smaller, but the argument is this is our moment. This is our moment to show the United States in particular, which they're focused on, the value of a relationship with us. Um, because a signal to Putin that the time has come to slow this down and stop. And it could be quiet and it could be discreet and you and I wouldn't know about it, but I suspect it would change the dynamics in the Biden administration toward the relationship with China. Which will they do? Um, <laughs> I don't know. My, my hunch here, and that's what it is, they're cautious, they're careful, they're deliberate, their style of decision-making is very different from Putin's. They will do whatever is least damaging to them uh, in this situation. They clearly are unhappy, there's no question, with a Russian attack against a sovereign state. That is a precedent that they worry about. They're clearly unhappy, but frankly, the least risky strategy for them right now, there's not much upside but the least risky strategy for them is just to do nothing while everybody asks them to do something. Both the NATO allies and Russia are asking them to do something. Just a reminder to people on the call, please feel free to submit uh, questions through the, through the chat facility. Um, I'd like to turn to one of those now. Uh, Janice, you mentioned the divided trading and financial system and, and the economic costs associated with that. What will this ultimately mean for world safety and security? And is this reversible if there was a regime change in, in Russia? 
So I, I think it's an important point. Is this reversible? Right. And that's a larger question. Uh, and, and, and let me just say two sentences um, about what might have to be reversed before we can talk about the larger. Let's assume for a moment that there will be at some point a ceasefire uh, and negotiations start. One of the conversations we've not had are sanctions reversible. Now, sanctions are what we call threat based strategies. We all have used them with our kids. If you do this, then I will do that. But if the, the sanctions the other side of it, if you don't do this, then I won't do that, right? Uh, we haven't had the second part of the conversation at all. We haven't put yet for good reason, but we haven't done it incentives on the table to Putin to say, if this war stops before two more cities are leveled, we here's a plan for how we reverse these sanctions. Now, we are very bad. We almost never reverse sanctions. It is really hard to do. The machinery gears up and we don't reverse. There is a long tail to get sanctions lifted, frankly. Um, and that's got to be part of the private discussions that are going on now, Mike, uh, because if, if they're not reversed, effectively, Russia is out of the global economy for the foreseeable future and literally driven um, to become a satellite for China. And if that happens, as you described, we have a divided system in ways we don't really fully understand because we've never had it. We, you know, we had a long period from 48 to 89 where we had a Cold War, but Russia's economy did not matter to us. It was irrelevant. It wasn't that is not true about China's economy. Um, and just imagine were we ever to use this kind of sanctions regime against China? Yes, China would suffer, but it would be catastrophic uh, for us. The economic consequences would be catastrophic. So it seems to me the policy making challenge for the next two or three years is to communicate how exceptional what we did was because the aggression was so brutal, but to invest a lot of effort in putting some fire breaks into the system so that we are not driven to the point that we were driven to a month ago, because we will divide the world. There's no question. And not we, I don't mean we the cause, I, the better way to say it, we will live in a divided world if some of these trends continue. Probably a good lead into the, to the next sort of theme. We're getting a lot of questions about other sort of participants and players, and, and so in particular, questions about you know Poland and its role in, in terms of the you know the whole refugee situation. Questions about who might emerge as a potential leader from mediation point of view. Uh, rather, you know, Israel as is mentioned in, in the questions. Um, Generally, who are some of the other actors and, and who do you see emerging in terms of playing kind of key roles? So uh, the question about Poland is really interesting. Um, yeah, Poland and, and its neighboring is very hungry, um, have been challenging for the European Union, not for NATO, but for the European Union as a result of its domestic practices. It had, it, you know, it has been regarded as a democratic backslider, along with Hungary, for several years now, and the European Union has really been struggling. Uh, just before this war started, uh, the European Union finally took a strong stand and said it would not transfer uh, the normal budget um, adjustments, really, they are across the European Union, unless it was real progress. Uh, in the way Poland dealt with its courts and Hungary dealt um, with the systematic um, repression of dissent. This invasion happened off the table, off the table. And you see a unification of NATO that we have not seen since the 1950s when the Soviet threat was very real to people. 
you know, Poland, Hungary, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, they are terrified right now. I've had the opportunity um, to meet with some of their scholars and leaders in, and there is a level of apprehension, Mike, that is difficult to convey to Canadians uh, who, you know, are, we are far away and removed and don't feel it. Now, how, so one big question, one of the reasons Biden is going to the summit, how long does this unity last? We saw the prime ministers of Poland, um, the Czech Republic and Slovenia actually take the train to Kiev. You can't imagine a stronger act of solidarity than that because a train, you know, is such a risky way to travel. Um, and I'm sure Russian intelligence knew they were doing it. So that is a strong statement of solidarity, but understand what that means. They want NATO to do more. <laughs> there are other NATO members who are saying, no, we cannot do more than we are doing or not much more. We stay under that threshold. We cannot become a combatant and we cannot provide more than defensive weapons. So we're already seeing some cracks in NATO and it is the job of the president of the United States um, to manage to keep this tough coalition together. Um, it's always easy to do at the beginning of a war, much harder as we go along. So that's a big part. The second question, who are potential interveners here? So the bottom line, people who have a decent relationship with Poland, with Russia. And that's why I, um, and, you know, and I've taken some criticism over the years and that's okay goes with the territories, but I believe in engagement strategies and keeping lines open because one, you can't do any risk assessment if you've walled off people and know nothing about them. And secondly, in times of crisis, that's what you need. So who's risen to the top of the pile now? Countries that have good relationships with both Ukraine and Russia. And the duo here are Israel and Turkey. Uh, both of whom have good relationships with both those countries and are ongoing, uh, making ongoing and continuing efforts um, to get a ceasefire and the beginnings of a political negotiation going. And I should say to everybody, those are closely coordinated with the White House. There's no rogue mediators operating here. Uh, this, the, the obvious one here is Xi Jinping. And extraordinary efforts are being made all the time um, to get him to have that one conversation with Putin. As I said, we won't know. It will be private. Uh, and again, it's because he has extraordinary leverage with Russia. The final group, and this is an interesting aside, are people, individuals who have good relationships with Putin. And they are often used under these kinds of, you send a personal envoy, and that's a, really a great way to do things. Because if the, if the effort produces nothing, you're way back, you've got plausible deniability, <laughs> there's almost no risk. There were a group of those people, but we sanctioned all of them. They were all oligarchs. And we sanctioned all of them right at the beginning of this. On reflection, we might have put a little more care and forward thinking into what role those people might play. Well, coming back to China then, um, as, as they sort of contemplate their role and whether they should intervene, how is the whole Taiwan dynamic kind of factoring into the, their calculus and how might that play out? You know, I, many people are, I, I wouldn't say asking that question, they're worrying about it. Um, what's really interesting is the differences that, the China, first of all, the Chinese government draws between Taiwan and Ukraine. They, 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 and the reason they draw these differences are interesting. They say, oh, there's no comparison between Taiwan and Ukraine. Ukraine is a sovereign, independent state. And we are opposed to attacks on sovereign independent states. Taiwan, part of China, part of us. So, so the differences they're drawing reject the sovereignty of Taiwan. Um, I think, uh, so that's not an encouraging reason that they're drawing differences. 
Let me also add that the, the, that the defense commitment that the United States has to Taiwan, although ambiguous, nevertheless is um, far more than the United States had to Ukraine. The United States fundamentally had none. And the risk calculation that uh, China would have to make with respect to Taiwan uh, would have to incorporate a much higher likelihood of U.S. engagement. I actually think, and here we're in the realm of speculation, I, always, I try to distinguish what I know and what I speculate on. This is speculation. I think it's very sobering for the Chinese. Uh, the willingness of the United States and other NATO allies to pay real economic costs because we've talked about the disaster that is going to overwhelm the Russian economy, but we are going to pay. There is a premium for what we're doing in wheat, in gas, in oil, in fertilizer, in inflation. This is just a jolt. Um, our banks, our central banks were struggling anyway to control inflation. This just jolts it upward. There's no question. These are, these are real supply shocks. Um, which can cause inflation. We get inflation from demand and from supply. This is on the supply side. I think the Chinese are looking at this and they are surprised as Putin by what the United States and NATO has done and the cost that they're willing to pay. Um, it is clearly not risk-free. Um, they cannot assume that it is risk-free. Now, that will have no impact uh, uh, on their uh, determination that Taiwan is part of China. That's been true ever since Nixon first went to China. There's never been any movement on that, but you calculate the risks um, depending on the conditions. I think this is sober. Uh, so I think it's less likely now <laughs> than it might have been two months ago is what I'm saying. And I don't think um, China's military is pushing for this right now because it needs more time. It's just everything we hear from our from China experts. Well, let's bring it a little closer to home and and talk about the potential implications for the Arctic, you know, given the obvious you know ge geographic uh, connection you know, involving Canada yeah. and Russia. Uh, any particular perspectives there? Yeah. Um, I, 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 one of the first things that happened was the suspension of Arctic Council meetings. The Arctic Council is an institution, it's an international institution that was actually created by Canada. It was Canadian leadership that set it up and brought together all the Arctic states. Uh, it's actually um, a wonderful moment in Canadian history uh, where a foundation in this country put an idea on the table. And our government took it up and created an institution which has become the most valuable institution, the Arctic Council, for shaping Arctic policy. Russia's our neighbor in the Arctic. That is the one place that Canada and Russia share borders, which is in the Arctic. And we have extensive collaboration with Russia on Arctic issues from stuff um, that is as practical and grounded as search and rescue. Uh, when we lose people or they lose people, we have very collaborative search and rescue missions that we run together. To uh, climate change, which is a huge issue in the Arctic where climate change has moved more quickly than it has in the more Southern parts of Canada to all sorts of issues around energy resources, safe passage. There's just a, a large, large agenda of issues that we work on in the Arctic Council. It's all now frozen and it's frozen Russia. Um, let me give another example. So this is all by way of saying that there are a set of global issues on which Russia will have to be engaged because they're too important. I'll give you one that is playing out right now in the world. Uh, the renewal of the agreement with Iran on limiting its nuclear forces. You all remember Obama negotiated that agreement. Trump walked away from it when Biden came back, one of his priorities. The administration literally got to the signing when this war started. And Russia said, 
okay, we're going to walk back our support for this and we're going to discourage Iran from signing this unless you tell us that when we um, trade with Iran, Iran is not going to be subject to secondary sanctions for doing so. Well, that put the United States, frankly, between a rock and a hard place. It really wants this agreement to keep a lid on nuclear proliferation um, in the Middle East, but you can well imagine how reluctant it is to exempt anybody from secondary sanctions from trading with Russia. And they back down, the United States back down. So we cannot go forward in this world by thinking we can read China and Russia out of the big global issues on which we need collaboration. And we need to find ways of engaging with people that we actively dislike, like the Putin administration, who have committed brutal acts. Um, and, it, and the harder challenge, explaining to the public, why do we do this? Because it is very, very hard for the public to understand and I can only echo what you said at the beginning of this program, Mike. What we have seen in Ukraine is horrifying. I did not think we would see this. I mean, I last saw it in Syria in the city of Aleppo that the Russians raised. Um, I never thought I would see something like this in Europe. It's horrifying. But our responsibility is to look forward and see what we need to do on other big issues that confront this country. Well, let's, let's talk about another key battlefield in this conflict, which is the information war. Yeah. Uh, Russia has launched a sweeping media crackdown, imposed you know, new censorship laws, banned various social media platforms. But we know it's hard to suppress information in the age of the internet, particularly when we have people like Arnold Schwarzenegger getting behind the cause. Uh, for his part, Zelensky has shown himself to be a, a really inspiring communicator and a real master of using social media to, to promote his message. Does this war mark a sea change in the role of social media in shaping ge the geopolitical landscape? So I don't think so. <laughs> I, and I'm pushing against the conventional wisdom. <laughs> I aware of you talking about social media. Um, let, let me make, just make a couple of quick comments here. One, the really innovative information strategy was uh, innovated by the United States. It was remarkable. I mean, my jaw dropped uh, starting uh, in January when the United States provided accurate intelligence publicly about a war that was coming, right? And began to shape the information space. The United States took the initiative and was not reacting. Um, it was met with some skepticism. U.S. intelligence doesn't have a great record in the last 20 years. People were dubious. French government didn't believe it. But nevertheless, the United States was the one that shaped the information space, not Russia, the United States. And gradually, and when it proved right, literally 100% right on, on his objectives as well, as on its execution, um, social media moved into a space that had already been shaped by the United States. Now, what an interesting story that is. That's a state shaping the information space way ahead of social media, which is reactive. Uh, secondly, um, social media is actually an asset here because everything you described about Putin is correct. He's closed down his country. And that's why we see this tragic story of Russians <laughs> leaving the country in an exodus that is larger than anything in recent Russian history. And who are these people that are leaving? And this is true about refugee populations generally. They are the most innovative, um, the best educated, the most resourced, because they have the initiative to get up and go. They're confident enough. So you can leave Russia with 200 rubles in your pocket, which some people have, but be confident you're going to find a place and be able to find a way to support your family. And these are all what I call the westernizers in Russia. So what you're seeing in Russia is permanent future damage, irrespective now 
of what the of what NATO does, which is I think, and 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 there's an argument that Putin wants this. He wants these people out uh, because he is pushing Russia into a much more repressive, much more closed system. But the the irony for him uh, is that Ukrainians and Russians have close personal relationships. There are VPNs, virtual private networks. You all know about that. There are these little keys. <laughs> and there's Telegram, where Ukrainians are texting people in Russia. You can't shut that down, Mike. So that's how the news is getting into Russia, about what a catastrophe this is. And that's where the dissenters who remain are getting their information. Um, I think social media, I think the negative impact of social media has been wildly exaggerated here. Interesting. Brenda, I know we're, we're getting close to the end here. I would like to squeeze one more if I could. Um, Quick the answer that, that. Uh, Janice referenced uh, early in her remarks, and I'm seeing a number of comments on the chat around uh, scenario analysis. Uh, we know that you know, risk man one of the most important risk management tools that we have when dealing with highly complex and interconnected risks such as this is scenario testing and analysis. Can you help us with that process, Janice, by describing what you think the you know plausible worst and best case scenario might look like? And maybe start with the worst case just so that there might be hopefully a better chance at ending on a on a Vanda, how long how long do I have? One minute? <laughs> well, I don't think it'd be the end of the world, Vanda, if we went slightly over. No, let's um, go ahead. Just answer the question. We okay. want to hear. Okay. Let me start with the worst case. I mean, it's really good advice. Mike, start with the worst case and then go to the better case, right? Uh, the worst case is clearly what everybody in my professional life who works on the same issues that I do is worried about, which is that we get the use of tactical nuclear weapons or chemical weapons. Um, I would just say that that is not impossible. Uh, which we might have thought even uh, three or four months ago, because the Russian military doctrine treats these tactical nuclear weapons different than we in the West do. For us in the West, crossing the nuclear threshold is breaking one of the deepest taboos that we have, not true in Russia. So here's the problem, and this is where it all comes back to decision making, uh, risk assessment, and strategy, which is what I live and breathe all the time. Imagine the battlefield bogs down even further, which, and the number of Russian casualties, military casualties grow, and the news, more and more news gets into Russia. In other words, imagine the war goes as well as possible for Ukraine. That is the condition, so the enabling condition for the scenario, for Putin to escalate to some use of unconventional weapons. That is what it is so difficult. I just, I just describe this kind of decision maker as a cornered decision maker who lashes out. And you know, there's a great deal of evidence that we get that in decision. It's some costs argument, right? In the investment community, you make a really bad investment, you lose a lot of money instead of just selling and saying, okay, that was a bad one. Yeah, pour more in because you're hopeful. And this is a not uncommon pattern, and it's how escalation that is not logical, but nevertheless is driven by the feeling that I'm going to double down. And we're all, you're hearing a lot of language now. I wrote a piece in Foreign Affairs a couple of weeks ago that worried about a corner decision maker who would double down, and that's what we're seeing, frankly, happening now. That's the worst case. That's the worst case. Um, the best case scenario um, is that we keep this supply going, supply line going to Ukraine. Uh, we are doing it's we are not talking much about this, but it's amazing what we what you know is done equivalent to the Berlin Airlift. We are flying in massive amounts of defensive weapons to Poland and Romania that are being offloaded and driven across the border. Um, we keep that going long enough um, for Putin to come to the decision that the gain is not worth the loss at this point. And there are some signals 
that if he agrees to a ceasefire and some withdrawal, some of the sanctions may be lifted. In other words, a calibrated strategy. And it's gonna require people with access to get that message to him. That is the best case scenario. Because, and this we do have good evidence for. All wars end when two conditions obtain. When both sides don't see much further upside to continuing, they recognize that they're, it's not, they're not gonna be able to transform the battlefield. The Ukrainians are already there, they know that. Uh, and the second is when there's a framework available for them to signal what they might concede, but which doesn't implicate them until they think there's a likelihood of getting an agreement. So that's our, that's the job of the world now, to provide that framework and safe space for negotiation. Well, Janice, all sorts of follow-up, you know, thoughts and questions that come to mind, but regrettably we're at the end of our time. It's just flown by. I feel we've just sort of scraped the, the surface here. But on behalf of all of us, uh, thanks again, you know, very much for your for your insights and and the active, you know, uh, advancing of the narrative, and in particular, and, and supporting GRI in that. Always insightful uh, thoughts, and very much appreciate you taking the time. And we look forward to to the next opportunity to uh, to engage with you. Um, with that, uh, Vanda, do you want to make some closing remarks? I think you're on mute. I'm on mute. Thanks to both you and Janice, uh, and thank you. We've come to the end of our webinar. As uh, as Mike just said, uh, there's still a lot of questions to be answered. Uh, for those of you leaving, a prompt will appear. We need a post webinar survey. I'll just remind you that's what I did at the beginning. Uh, and thank you all for joining us this morning. And remind you that there's a couple of macroeconomic sessions coming up. One on March 31st, uh, and one on April 14th. And uh, Registrations for that can be found on our website, uh, and I think those will prove to be very interesting sessions. Uh, so thanks, Jan Janice, again.